There is a very short list of gear that I would recommend to pretty much any producer without context. And this is on that list. Today we're taking a long overdue deep dive into this best-selling MIDI controller from an iPad producer's perspective. And stick around because I'm gonna also be showing you how to map this thing to work flawlessly with Beatmaker 3. What is up creatives? It's Jarrell, your music technologist, here to help you master the tech you need to make music freely. I wanna say thank you guys for waiting so patiently for more content. I'm excited to get into it. Also, this video is sponsored by DistroKid. More on that in a bit. Let's talk about this Akai MPK Mini Mark III. So, off top, if you've seen some music production online, you've probably seen this thing pop up. Now, I can guarantee you, you've never seen it in this colorway because I, I did this custom. So no, you can't find it with uh, with this these custom skins on here. This is actually the black on black version that Akai sells. But what is this? It's a MIDI controller. This is what you plug into your device to be able to do things with your hands. That's a very simplified version, but producers that use laptops and desktops, this is all they got. Fortunately, in the iPad world, we can use the touchscreen, uh, but if you wanna take it a level deeper, you need a MIDI controller. The easiest MIDI controller for me to recommend is this right here, the Akai MPK Mini Mark III. And that's for a simple reason. It's because it checks the most boxes in a small form factor for a great price. This thing comes in at a total of $119. You can pick this up on Amazon in some dope colorways, mind you. Uh, this was the black on black. Another one that I really like is the gray and black, uh, but they got a reverse white and black. All, all of the, the colorways are fire in my opinion. The standard colorway comes with a red, black, and white combo. And some extra credit, Akai actually means red in Japanese, so that's why you see all the red branding and the red LEDs. Fun fact. Let's get this thing plugged up and we'll take a look at some of the features. Personally, I'm someone that loves USB-C, all the things, but uh, most MIDI controllers are still running with this USB-B port back here in the back, like the printer cable. So I highly recommend getting yourself one of these. This is a USB-B to USB-C adapter. And it basically just takes that USB-B to USB-C, but it's a right angle, which is convenient. Anyway, pop that bad boy on, use my USB-C cable, plug it in. By the way, I will leave links to that adapter down in the description, as well as a link to this MIDI controller so you can pick one up for yourself. Yes, they are affiliate links, but it costs you nothing extra to use them and it helps out the channel. So now that we got it plugged up, you can see all of the LEDs are illuminated. We're looking at a 25 key key bed here, eight pads backlit. Uh, with eight endless encoders here. So those are the knobs, but they continue spinning. And like I've said in the past, endless encoders are helpful because you don't have to zero them out before you start using them. It picks up where your software left off. So endless encoders, eight pads and 25 keys with pitch and modulation on this little joystick here. It's got an actual sustain pedal jack on the back also comes with a built-in arpeggiator. We're looking at a powerhouse of a controller and a very small form factor. This thing fits in just about any bag I throw it in and it is very nice to have on the go. But the value doesn't just stop at the hardware. This thing also comes bundled with some software. So as I show you on the back of the box, you've got their Hybrid 3 High Definition Analog Synth, Mini Grand Acoustic Instrument, Velvet Vintage Electric Piano Instrument, as well as access to the free Akai software MPC Beats, where you can pretty much make some really full-fledged instrumentals and maybe even full songs. It's a pretty powerful, fully functioning free DAW. Obviously, that's not available on iPad yet, but it is available on the desktop, Mac, and PC side. Once you've registered your MPK Mini, you can download the MPK Software Manager, and from there you can install all the bundled software, as well as the MPK Mini Editor, where you can go in and customize your MIDI controller and all of the presets with the click of a button. So right here is the MPK Mini Software Manager. One thing it doesn't mention on the box is you also get access to all these MPC sound packs 
which is pretty fire. So you can go in there and download those for free in addition to these instrument plugins and the free software NPC Beats. All that bundled with the hardware for $119 is a pretty sweet deal. This is where you can install everything onto your computer uh, and you can go and you can open up the MPK Mini Editor Mark III. Before I move on to showing you guys how to map this controller, a quick message from our sponsor, DistroKid. If you make music that you intend for other humans to hear and you're not using DistroKid, you're making a mistake. DistroKid is one of the simplest and most affordable ways to distribute your music to streaming services and online stores and collect your due revenue from those streams and sales. On top of that, DistroKid offers all kinds of free perks and services to their subscribers, like the ability to create mini videos for your releases to share anywhere, or these cool promo cards to promote your release on your socials. Click my link in the description to get 7% off your first year of DistroKid. And when you support DistroKid through my link, you also support this channel, so thank you for that. So when you first load this program, this is what it's gonna look like. You've gotta make sure you have your MIDI controller plugged in to your computer, and then you can go ahead and start doing things. So the first thing you wanna do, if you look over here, these are your eight programs. Those programs correspond to the eight pads that you see right here. So if you press program select, and you move to a different pad, you now completely wiped everything that's on here, and you have a fresh set of parameters that you can edit for different programs. The way I use this is I use a different one for each music production app that I use. So if I want one for Beatmaker 3, I can do that. If I want a different, completely different mapping for Koala Sampler, I can do that. Different mapping for Cubasis 3, I can do that and so on. I can even put some on here for my laptop, but I haven't done that. So for now though, we're gonna keep program select on the first one. And then what we wanna do first before we mess with anything is hit this receive button. And that's gonna take everything that you have in program one here and it's gonna open it up and show you what you got. You can change the program name to whatever you want. The main thing I would change is this external part down here in the arpeggiator settings. So the clock is by default set to internal, but I like to put it to external. What that does is when I want to open up Beatmaker 3 and I wanna use the arpeggiator to play some notes and I want it to be in time with the project I'm working on, you gotta make sure you have external clock turned on before you open the app or it's not gonna work. Having this setting set to external by default alleviates some of that issue. If you decide you wanna change what some of these notes are for bank A and bank B on the pads, you can do that. You can change what these knobs do. You can also change what each direction of the joystick does. I personally like where everything else is at, so I'm just gonna keep it. Once you're done changing the parameters, you have to make sure you hit send under the program you want. This is a program one, and then I'll hit send here and that sends it to my MIDI controller, and I'm good to go. Now you can map this for any of the eight programs that you have available with these pads, and I think that's super helpful. So who is a device like this for? It's for people that need the most amount of input you can get in one compact device. People that value portability, being able to take this with you wherever you go. Now, if you don't mind using multiple large MIDI controllers in conjunction with one another, the space that takes up, the amount of cables you gotta use, you can have a better experience. The things that this does well, others can do much better, but it's gonna take multiple devices and you're not gonna get it this compact. Obviously, these keys are very tiny. It's not for people that need a full keyboard weighted experience. But since we're already talking about the keys, how is the key bed? It's actually pretty good. Now, obviously the keys are pretty small, but the response is really nice. There's enough give in the key bed to feel like you're actually pressing something, but it doesn't feel like cheap plastic. It does feel like there's some actual quality mechanisms working on the inside. Now this is very small though. I find myself not using my thumbs a lot when using this keyboard and focusing on playing chords in a way that's technically not correct, but MIDI keyboards as small aren't meant for playing a lot of big expressive chords. I have noticed that the key bed can take a little bit more force than you would expect to get some sound out of it, but this is something that can be manually adjusted let me show you really quick how you can do that. So I've got the Ravenscroft app open just for reference.
So you can get some real piano sound out of here, but I noticed gotta like really whack it to get some response out of it. Now I'm not gonna pretend like I understand fully what each of these settings changes, but I'll show you what I've learned about how I can get better settings out of it. So if you press this full level button right here, press and hold it and watch the screen up here, you'll notice, yeah, you'll notice there are some settings we can change now. So V1 by default is set to 24, V2 is eight, V3 is six, V4 is 2.4, and then black balance is 0.7. Those are the default settings. If you're going to adjust this, I highly recommend uh, taking a screenshot so that you know what they are originally. But you can edit these using the knobs. So this is K1 right here, which adjusts the V1 knob. K2 is right here, that moves V2. And if I move it, you'll see V2 goes up. Now, if you want to get some more action out of it, I would recommend cranking this up to about 15.2 and then cranking V3 up to 8.2. And then you'll notice it's much more responsive. So you still get a good velocity curve, but it is much more responsive. You can get to that that sounds you want a little easier. So we talked about the keys, but how are the pads? These are MPC quality pads, not even gonna front. They are just about the same size. They're a little bit smaller and a little bit thinner, but the feel, the feel is great. They are accurate and sensitive. I don't get a lot of double triggers. Personally, I've never used a MIDI controller where I never got double triggers, but I don't get very many with this one. Now the pads are split up using this bank A button right here, bank A, B. So right here is a fresh set of eight pads. If I hit bank A, B, you'll notice that turns green. That is a second set of eight pads. And I'll show you guys how you can map that in your DAW separately in a little bit. So in total, by pressing one button, you can turn eight pads into 16 pads, which is nice. Now the endless encoders that we have over here, there are eight of them, uh, but eight is all you get. Pressing the bank button does not give you a fresh set of eight knobs. Now you'll notice these knobs also have uh, labels down below them, like division swing, mode, octave, latch, sync, plus and minus. You'll notice a lot of these same parameters are across the keys here and you can use them either way. So this is when you're using stuff like the arpeggiator or changing modes or octaves. You got buttons for octaves here, but you can also use the knob if you really want to. I think that's nice to have those options. Now pitch bend and modulation, you've got this joystick right here. I've noticed this to be a bit of a polarizing subject. People either hate it or they love it. I personally am indifferent. I don't mind it. I don't love it, but it's fine. Uh, I do like pitch and modulation touch strips or wheels, but I, I don't have a problem using this joystick. I find it to be accurate enough. And to be honest, I don't do a ton of pitch bending anyway. And when I do, it's been fine. So as far as physical things they crammed on this thing, uh, what's left is the arpeggiator here. We've got on and off for that. We've got tap tempo. Then you've got your octaves up and down. You've got your full level button, which basically turns the pads into non-velocity sensitive pads. So it's the same every time. You turn that off, you can get velocity sensitivity. That full level button applies only to the pads, not to the keys. Then you've got note repeat. So if I press that and then I press a note, I'm just pushing down and lifting. Now notice that doesn't apply to the keys, just to the pads. Can be really nice for stuff like hi-hats. And both the arpeggiator and the note repeat can be mapped to either go with the tempo you tap here, or it can be mapped to external MIDI coming from your DAW. And you can change that by holding the arpeggiator button and turning the sync knob to external up here. Now let me show you how to map this controller in Beatmaker 3. And even if you don't use Beatmaker 3, it should be helpful for you to see how to map this in pretty much any DAW. Let's go. All right, loading up Beatmaker 3. The first thing you're gonna wanna do is hit settings, Make sure you have your Akai MPK Mini 3 right here connected, and it is. Then you're gonna to wanna to go over to MIDI Focus Actions. I have a template saved up here that I can load, and that is right here. I will 
leave that template linked down below and you can download it. You'll get the full map of everything I've done here to make this thing run great with Beatmaker 3. And I'll drop that link down below. But let me show you if you wanna do it from scratch, how it can be done. So really quick, we're gonna clear all the bindings. That just basically just makes everything clean here. Nothing already loaded. And then you wanna start at the very top. You can hit auto learn so that it continues to go along, uh, but it starts with trigger pad one. I like tr pad one to be down here at the bottom. We'll go one, two, three, four, and so on. Then once you've gotten to eight, you're gonna to wanna to hit pad bank a, B, that switches it to a new set of pads. So if you look here, you'll notice, you can start here with pad nine, 10, 11, and so on. Once you've got all 16 mapped, I would turn off stop learn, and then we can look at mapping some transport controls. Now, one major pitfall for this controller, as you've seen, is that there are no transport controls on the device, which is kind of rough. Uh, I wish there was a play, pause, something somewhere. Unfortunately, there is no such thing. But the way we get around this is by using CC buttons. If you press this CC button right here, you'll notice it gets a little brighter. And then now we can map these eight pads to some transport controls. What I like to do, if I scroll all the way down here, you'll notice here are the transport options. We'll start by hitting the play one and we'll turn on auto learn. And then you're gonna wanna start where you wanna start on the controller. So personally, I like play to be right here. Then I like stop to be over here. I like backward to be right here. I like forward to be right here. I set the loop button up here and somehow I skipped record. Record goes right here, so stop play, record, loop. That kind of matches up at the top. Stop, play, record, get your forward and backward, which I have mapped here, and then you have loop. Now, the benefits to mapping it this way using the CC buttons means when I want to go ahead and go from playing something on the pads to pressing stop or play, all I have to do is turn this CC button on or off. From there, I like to go about mapping the macro knobs to the macros tab. So I'll select macro one, and then I'll just move the knob and that picks it up. Keep going until I get through the first eight. Now the very last thing I like to map is since I have two more CC buttons left on my eight pads, I like to go ahead and use them for previous bank and next bank so I can switch between the instruments I'm playing pretty seamlessly. So I hit previous bank right here, map this one, next bank right here, map that one, bada bing, the whole thing is now mapped. You don't have to map the piano keys, they're already mapped to MIDI notes. So you'll notice with everything loaded and mapped, I can start doing stuff like Pads perform really nice. The last thing I wanna show you guys is how killer of a setup you can make with this and the iPad if you're on the go. So personally, when I'm on the go, the iPad is always in the Magic Keyboard case from Apple. Sometimes I'll take it out of the case if I'm gonna beat on the on-screen pads or whatever. But if I got this bad boy with me, I'm not gonna need the on-screen pads anyway. So what I like to do is you can take your cable, plug it in the back, and this, if you tilt your screen all the way, as far as it will go, this will slide right in there underneath the screen. You can wrap the cable around back and plug that bad boy in. You basically just created your own MPC out of an iPad and a MIDI controller like this one. It's a pretty sleek, pretty sick setup. Slap this down at a coffee shop and get to work. Crank out some beats. So, my quick question to you, does the MPK Mini Mark III check enough boxes for you? Is there another MIDI keyboard in this form factor and price range that you think gets it right? Let me know down in the comments. Until next time, creatives, go make something dope, and I'll see you in the next video.